after electromagnetism okay and we understand what is a magnetization what is the difference between a electromagnet and permanent magnet uh, how your magnets fields lines are passing what is the direction okay this is a electromagnet what is the magnetic flux what is the unit of magnetic flux what is the characteristic of magnetic flux lines then flux density its definition its equation b is equal to 5 by a its unit is weber per meter square or you can say the tesla and then another term is magnetomotive force it is similar to the electromotive force in the electrical circuit same way magnetic flux you can compare with the current in the electrical circuit so this is the analogy between electric and magnetic circuit so mmf is nothing but ampere into tons product of current flowing through the coil and number of co tons in the coil then next term is magnetic field intensity magnetomotive force per unit length that gives the magnetic field intensity same like a electric field intensity in the electrical circuit that we call e clear then is the permeability same like a permittivity in the electrical circuit relative permeability its definition then last we see the magnetic magnetism based on the magnetism we classify the magnetic material in three way one is ferromagnetic material second is paramagnetic material and third one is diamagnetic material so all three have a different properties that we have seen in the last lecture and there are different materials you can see in a ferromagnetic in iron cobalt nickel paramagnetic aluminum and platinum then diamagnetic material silver copper and hydrogen clear yeah. so that we up to this point we have seen in the last lecture the next point is reluctance so what is called as a reluctance a reluctance is same like a, a resistance in the magnetic circuit okay so if you see the definition here in the sir are you sharing my screen yes sorry i can't see sir then dekha the screen i have shared the screen the ppt is not visible okay sorry well now you can see this yes sir okay okay so let's i repeat again this all this thing okay bran dekha hi jaye ppt yes sir okay so we first start the definition of magnetization then we see the what is the difference between a electric uh, electromagnet and permanent magnet and this is the definition of magnetic field what is called magnetic field and in which direction it will flow okay what is called as pole then we see the magnetic flux what is called as magnetic flux and its characteristic there are five different characteristics its unit is weber then next term is flux density which is nothing but flux per unit area as more number of flux lines are passing in the unit area then its flux density is more so from this term you can find out the flux density then its unit is weber per meter square or you can say tesla the next term is magnetomotive force uh, it is same la like a electromotive force in the electric circuit here yeah. magnetic flux in the magnetic circuit where similarly in the electric circuit that is a current flowing in the electrical circuit and its unit is ampere turns or you can say that mmf so mmf is nothing but product of current flowing through the coil and number of turns in the coil mmf is equal to n into i then next term is a magnetic field intensity same as the electric field intensity in the electrical circuit then permeability similar to the permittivity in the electrical circuit relative permeability then last we see the magnetism depend upon the magnetism we see the classification of magnetic material three way ferromagnetic material paramagnetic material and diamagnetic material so paramagnetic material is in short we can say that flux can be easily set up 
when you provide the MMF, where in the paramagnetic material, flux can be set up easily, but not as easy as compared to the ferromagnetic material. And in diamagnetic material, flux cannot easily pass through this type of the material. So you can see this diagram. They are repelled from this material in this diamagnetic material. Okay. So these are the three characteristics of this material based on that it is classified ferromagnetic, paramagnetic and diamagnetic material. So in the first lecture, we see up to this point. Is there any doubt in this first lecture? So I think for the sir, next, oh, yes. Sir, how the alignment of field changes according to the material? What? How does the alignment of field changes according to the material? That is a property of material. See, this is a diamagnetic material, silver, copper or hydrogen. So in that, flux cannot pass through it easily. Here, so it flux lines are become away from this material. So you can see that very small number of lines are passing through it. So that's why the alignment are changes. That is a property of material. It is same like a, a conductor and insulating material in the electrical circuit. Why current is cannot easily flow in the insulating material? Why current can easily flow in the conducting material? Because the property of the material, so the same way here in the magnetic material. Yes. Understand all of you? Hmm? Yes, sir. All of you understand? Is there any doubt? No, sir. Okay. So next point is next term is reluctance. So what is reluctance? Can you know this? Can you know about this term reluctance? Or can you compare this term with the electrical term? Yes, anyone? Reluctance in the magnetic circuit. Are you going to learn more in the physics subject, 11th or 12th? Reluctance. What is called reluctance? Yes or no? Yes. Are you going to learn reluctance term? No, sir. Okay. So reluctance is what? That is same like a resistance in the electrical circuit. If the electrical circuit my resistance are same way here in the magnetic circuit we have reluctance. So what is the property of resistance in the electrical circuit? They oppose the flow of current. Clear? Same way here in the magnetic circuit, the property of this reluctance is that or characteristic of the material is that that oppose the setup of the magnetic flux in the material. So reluctance to curse magnetic flux ne oppose curse. So that property is called as that property of the material that is called as a reluctance. Same like a resistance property of any material. Yeah. So the definition is that it opposition offered to the magnetic circuit to establish the magnetic flux. Clear. Yeah. So as we know that we have classified the magnetic material in three parts. One is ferromagnetic, second is paramagnetic and another is diamagnetic material. So as we know that in the ferromagnetic material, we can easily pass the magnetic flux line when we applied the MMF, magnetomotive force. Here it means that magnetic flux can easily set up in ferromagnetic material like nickel, nickel and iron cobalt all these three material okay so we can say that the reluctance of these three material is lower because they can easily pass the magnetic flux or they can easily establish the magnetic flux line through this material where well, diamagnetic material is what the material which oppose the establishment of the magnetic flux so in the diamagnetic material the reluctance is low sorry reluctance is high clear so this is the property of the magnetic material that to oppose the establishment of the magnetic flux. Same like a resistance in the electrical circuit. So as you can see the mathematical equation of this reluctance we called as S is equal to L divided by nu zero into nu R into A. So as you know the equation of resistance in the electrical circuit R is equal to rho L by A. Clear. 
same way here in the magnetic circuit we have reluctance equation is l divided by nu0 into nu r into a here yeah. so l is what l is nothing but the length of magnetic path in which magnetic flux is passing that is the length of magnetic flux path nu0 that we know that absolute permeability is constant 4 pi into 10 h to minus 7 h per meter and nu r is relative permeability of the material clear yeah. Uh, I think one of the students have a microphone is on. Please turn off your microphone, please, so that not create any noise in between this lecture. Once you have any doubt or to ask the question, or only that time, turn on this mic. Okay. Okay. So nu r is the relative permeability of the material. A is the cross-sectional area. So unit of this perme uh, unit of this reluctance is what mmf per Weber. Unit of reluctance S is what mmf per Weber. Then next term is permeance. So permeance is same like a conductance in your electric circuit. The conductance is what in the electric circuit means from the conductance we can measure that how much amount of electric current that material can flow easily through. Here yeah, same way permeance. So permeance is what. reciprocal of reluctance here yeah. same like a conductance is what reciprocal of resistance same here in the magnetic circuit permeance is reciprocal of re reluctance clear yeah. so permeance is what that is nothing but a conductance of magnetic circuit and reluctance is what the resistance of magnetic circuit clear yeah. that is the analogy between electric and magnetic circuit so that is the one point you can write in the comparison between magnetic and electric circuit so how you can measure so it is a measure of is with which a flux can be set up in the magnetic circuit so how you can easily set up the flux that can be measured by this parameter permeance of the material this you denoted by delta its unit is weber per mmf exactly opposite to the unit of reluctance exactly inward not opposite but exactly inward unit of reluctance ampere turns per weber permeance unit is weber per ampere turns clear yeah. so it is analog to the conductance as i told you permeance is reciprocal of reluctance clear yeah. then reluctivity reluctance and reluctivity both are the different thing so reluctance means what the opposition offered to the magnetic flux clear yeah. same like a resistance in the electric circuit so in the electric circuit you know the resistivity clear yeah. same here in the magnetic circuit that is called as a reluctivity clear yeah. so reluctivity definition or a, it also called as a specific reluctance so definition is that it is defined as the reluctance offered by the magnetic circuit of unit length and unit cross section area so mathematically you know the equation of reluctance s is equal to l divided by nu0 nu r a nu is equal to what nu0 into nu r clear yeah. so as per the definition of reluctivity or specific reluctance that in one unit length it means in 1 meter or one unit cross sectional area or you can say that 1 meter square how much reluctance is offered by the material that is called as a reluctivity so if you put this value l is equal to 1 meter a is area is equal to 1 meter square in the equation of reluctance so you get the 1 upon nu clear yeah. so as per the definition of the reluctivity this equation is give the value of reluctivity or you can say that specific reluctance clear yeah. so 1 upon nu that is what specific reluctance or reluctivity it is inverse of absolute permeability nu is what absolute permeability so the reluctivity is equal to reciprocal of absolute permeability and its unit is what meter per henry clear yeah? because the unit of absolute permeability is what henry per meter so exactly inverse of this meter per henry and it is analog to the resistivity in the electric circuit clear yeah? jeevithe electric circuit ma resistivity je same way in the magnetic circuit we have reluctivity clear up to this point now 
go for the next point electromagnetic induction anyone know about this term electromagnetic induction what is called as electromagnetic induction koi ne khayal se what is called electromagnetic induction yes anyone yes sir yes what is means of electromagnetic induction can sir, give me the answer please yes yes sir when current is uh, when the current is induced when uh, when a magnetic material is passed through a, a conducting coil current Whether, induced in magnetic material or in a coil current induced in the coil due to the magnet moving on in off. coil when coil. magnetic yes, yes, when yes, magnetic yes. material is passed through it yes when to move the magnet near to the coil the coil induces the current that is called as the electromagnetic induction clear so the process of generating a current in a circuit by changing the magnetic field that concept is called as the electromagnetic induction and magnetic field line that must be cut perpendicular by the relative motion of the magnet or conductor so if you move the magnet or conductor relative to each other each other and if you cut the flux line of magnet to the conductor so that conductor induce the current in it that phenomenon is called as the electromagnetic induction now question is that how this current is induced in the conductor how this current is induced in the conductor by the motion of magnet and conductor that is the Sir, reason of you saw this and up flux will change when we are changing yes. the magnetic field then amount of flux uh, induced will be changed and that change in flux will produce current yes but there is a some missing point between the rate of change of flux and induce the current in the coil what happens in between that if rate of change of flux happens so directly current is flowing into the coil or before the current flowing into the coil there is something so that force the to flow the current into the coil what is the quantity or what is that parameter between that two instant when rate of change of flux happens and when current induced in the coil in between that there is something or there is something force which drives the current to flow into the coil so what that what that force means what is called that force force na su kahe che electromagnetic force yes yes as you know that in the electric circuit where current is flowing when you provide the emf or voltage emf means electromotive force so what happens when rate of change of flux happens when you move the magnet and conductor with each other so rate of change of flux that create what induce the emf in the coil and that induced emf in the coil that creates the current in the coil and that current is called as the induced current because that current is flowing because of the induced emf clear so when rate of change of flux happens in the coil that induce the emf in the coil and because of that current is flowing into the coil and that current is called as the induced current clear yes. not directly by rate of change of current current is induced in between that first emf is induced and because of that induced emf current is flowing clear yes. so how to create this electromagnetic induction so either you can move the magnet or you can move the wire clear so here you can see the picture one of the electromagnet uh, one of one of the permanent magnet we have and one is the coil of one turn and we connect the galvanometer in series with this coil so when you move the magnet your galvanometer is deflected or uh, if you move this coil and your magnet is fixed there at that time also galvanometer is moved so moving of this galvanometer indicate that current is flowing into the coil clear but this galvanometer is move only and only if 
there is a rate of change of flux linked with the coil so when rate of change of flux linked with the coil only and only when there is a relative motion between magnet and coil if your coil is stationary if your magnet is stationary then there is no current is flowing or there is no current induced in your coil at that time this galvanometer shows the zero reading but when you move the magnet up or down in the coil or if you move the magnet or coil anyone then at that time rate of change of flux links with the coil that induce the current because of the induced emf in the coil clear so that you can also see graphically if i show you this graphical representation so you can see this video that you can see this electromagnetic electromagnetic all of you see this video badhane dekhai chhe yes or no no sir no sir no sir nahi dekha tha one minute દેખાય છે બધાને વિડિયો ઇલેક્ટ્રોમેગ્નેટિક ઇન્ડક્શન આવાજ આવે છે સર ઓન્લી ઓડિયો વી કેનોટ સી ધ વિડિયો સર વી કેન સી ધ વિડિયો વી કેન ઓન્લી લિસન ઓકે 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 1 મિનિટ 1 મિનિટ Now you can see this. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. देखा जाए बताने? Okay. बताने audio आवे चे? Out of copper wire. आवे चे? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So let's see this video and understand this concept of electromagnetic electromagnetic induction. Prepare a circular coil out of copper wire. Connect the two ends of this coil to the two terminals of a sensitive galvanometer with a scale having zero at the center. This closed circuit is shown in the diagram. Note that this circuit contains no source of electricity and the galvanometer shows zero reading initially. Take a bar magnet NS and move it swiftly towards the coil with its north pole facing the coil. You will observe a deflection in the galvanometer when the magnet is moving. The deflection indicates that current is set up in the coil. Now, move the magnet away from the coil. The galvanometer shows again a deflection but in the opposite direction. This means current is set up in the opposite direction. If you hold the magnet with its south pole facing the coil and repeat the above steps, the deflections are again observed. but are reversed similarly motion of the coil itself also produces deflections in the galvanometer when the magnet is kept stationary do you observe any deflection when you just hold the magnet stationary near the coil at rest no a relative motion of a magnet and a coil induces the current in the coil The current produced by a relative motion of the coil or the magnet is called an induced current and is said to be set up by an induced electromotive force EMF. The production of an induced EMF in a coil in a closed circuit by the relative motion of a magnet and its coil is called the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction. So all of you understand this concept? Yes all of you yes yes sir yes, sir okay now you can see this presentation yes, yes sir. sir okay so 
when the current is flowing when your coil is having a closed path if coil is open then current will not flowing into the coil because to flow the current you require the closed path clear so based on the motion of coil and permanent magnet that induce the current and the direction of that current is depend upon the polarity of the poles whether it is n pole or s pole so deflection of galvanometer that is depend upon the direction in which we move the magnet okay so this is a electromagnetic induction so based on this electromagnetic induction faraday's developed the two laws first called as a faraday's first law of electromagnetic induction so what it say that it say same thing a relative motion of wire and magnetic field will induce the emf or you can say that voltage if there is a complete circuit this is a important term uh, important sentence if there is a complete circuit then and then current will induce in this coil if your coil is open then current will not induce in your coil clear so this is a faraday's first law of electromagnetic induction so as we saw in the uh, animation you can make the magnet stationary or you can move the coils and put the coil stationary and you can move the magnets so to create the rate of change of flux linkages to induce the emf in the coil and that induce the current clear so or third possibility that coil is stationary magnetic field lines are changing clear by rotating the coil clear so this induced emf into this coil that is directly proportional to the rate at which the flux lines are cut clear so if you move this magnet very fast so that it will create the more rate of change of flux linkages and that create the more induced emf and your current will be increases clear yeah. so the magnitude of the induced emf or magnitude of the current flowing into the coil that depends upon the rate of change of flux linkages if more rate of change of flux links with the coil more current or more induced emf clear yeah. so that is the faraday's first law of electromagnetic induction so same thing here it is written with that we have seen in the graphic uh, animation video second law of electromagnetic induction so what it say that it says that the magnitude of the induced emf is equal to rate of change of flux linkages with the coil yes that we have discussed in the previous slide so flux linkages is what what is the meaning of flux linkages with the coil so flux linkages is nothing but product of number of turns in your coil into flux associated with the coil clear yeah. so ampere into turns or you can say that flux into turns that gives the amount of induced emf in the coil that is the second law of electromagnetic induction so here suppose we find out net flux linkage with the coil suppose we consider the two instantis consider the magnet that is approaching towards the coil your coil is fixed your magnet is moving so here we consider there are two instant one is t1 time and another is t2 time so suppose assume that at t1 time the flux linkage with the coil is equal to n into phi1 n is number of turns of the coil and phi1 is the flux linkage with the coil so at that time that much of flux is linked with the coil at time t1 at time t2 suppose flux linkage with the coil is phi2 so we call n phi2 that is the total amount of flux linkage with the coil so change in the flux linkage in this two time interval t1 to t2 it is how much difference between these two n phi2 minus n phi1 n is common so it is n into phi2 minus phi1 so that amount of flux is linked with the coil between this two instant of time from t1 to t2 here if we call phi2 minus phi1 as phi so that is a flux linkage that is a change of flux with respect to time from t1 to t2 
so we call as a flux linkages with the coil so change in the flux linkage that is what n phi because phi to minus phi one is replaced by phi so now rate of change of flux linkage with respect to time that you can write like this way n phi by t this flux is changes with respect to time because as you move the magnet with respect to coil so with respect to time the flux is changes clear yeah. so rate of change of flux linkage with respect to time it means mathematically you can write n phi by t this one if you take the derivation of this term so you get what n is constant because number of coil is constant clear yeah. so n into d phi by dt you get so that rate of change of flux linkage that induce what emf clear yeah. so you can write down n d phi by dt is equal to what e that is nothing but induced emf but according to the faraday's laws of electromagnetic induction the rate of change of flux linkage is equal to induced emf but you can see here the negative sign so what this negative sign indicates that the negative sign indicates that the direction of this induced emf in the coil that oppose the cause of the production of it like okay, generally they produce the induced emf that induced emf oppose that thing so what is the reason of production of induced emf that is nothing but rate of change of flux that is nothing but d phi by dt so this induced emf e oppose this rate of change of flux so mathematically that's why it is written minus n d phi by dt so induced emf e is not positive n d phi by dt it is negative n d phi by dt because induced emf direction is oppose the d phi by dt oppose the cause of production of this generally they produce the which n is opposed kare and that phenomenon is or that law is called as a lenz law hame bhaneya so lenz law okay so what is lenz law says that when emf is induced according to the faraday's law the polarity or the direction of the induced emf is such that it oppose the cause of its production so what is the cause of the production of this emf rate of change of flux d phi by dt so that's why this negative sign shows that the direction of induced emf and direction of change in the magnetic field both are in opposite direction clear yeah. all of you understand this lenz law induced emf is minus n d phi by dt why it is a negative sign all of you clear this all of you clear yes or no yes sir yes, sir yes okay okay yes, sir so here i saw this one video regarding this lenz law so i think you can understand very clearly Are you able to see this video? No, sir. No, sir. One minute. Now we can see this. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Sir. Okay. Yes. Sir. Audio, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. We've got two magnets here, and we're discovering, not surprisingly. that opposite poles attract the red pole is north and the unmarked pole is south according to faraday when a conductor is pulled across magnetic field lines an electric current flows in the conductor now we already know that a current in a conductor will in turn create another magnetic field and the important point and this is a really really critical point and it's why lenz's law is so important the magnetism that's created in the ring fights the change in magnetism that produced it so in other words when i try to push this magnet through the ring the ring creates a magnetism that pushes back so i don't get something for nothing i don't get an electric current without working let's set up a demonstration we'll take the aluminum ring we started with it's light and it's not magnetic 
will drop the ring between the poles of a very strong horseshoe magnet. If there were no magnetism here, the ring would fall under the influence of gravity. But as it enters the poles, we induce a current in the ring because we're increasing the number of magnetic field lines, or what we call magnetic flux, enclosed within the ring. A current starts flowing in the ring, the ring becomes an electromagnet. The poles of the induced electromagnet oppose the poles of the horseshoe magnet, and so the magnetic field of the big magnet creates a net upward force on the ring, opposing the force of gravity and slowing the ring's descent. As the ring exits the pole region, the flux that it encloses starts to decrease, inducing a current in the opposite direction. But that current also opposes its fall. In each case, the ring falls much slower than we expect it to. This is because Lenz's law applies. One of the critical tests of a scientific theory is whether we can predict anything. If what we've just said about Lenz's law is true, if we can keep current from flowing in the ring, the effect disappears. So what if we were to take the ring that we just dropped and put a small cut in it so there was not a closed path for current? According to that, the ring should not be influenced by Lenz's law and it should drop entirely under the influence of gravity. Here we've got a ring with that cut in it. When we drop it through the magnet, we note that it falls unimpeded with no surprising delays as we just saw in the previous example. Another way to have a look at Lenz's law. All of you understand this? Up to this? Yes? Yes, sir. Yep. Demonstration. Yes, sir. Okay, see the second Lenz's demonstration? Law would be to imagine that instead of one ring, as we've just seen, we had many rings. And those rings were stacked together to form a tube. If a magnet were to go down that tube, it would induce a current in each ring, and each current would fight back against the magnet. So we'll take a thin tube and a powerful magnet. The tube, of course, would be not made out of iron or steel so that there were not any magnetic effects on the tube. Let's drop a pencil through the tube, a non-magnetic object, to see that under normal circumstances, gravity controls the behavior and the pencil falls through as rapidly as we expect. But when we drop a magnet through it, it takes much longer. Why is that? As the magnet falls through the tube, the obvious force acting on it is gravity. But along with gravity, as it falls through each ring of the tube, it induces a current around the ring. The current produces a magnetic field that pushes back on the magnet. So the magnet's now feeling three forces, one downward from gravity, one upward as the lower electromagnet repels it, and one upward as the upper electromagnet attracts it. The two magnetic forces counteract the gravity, and so the magnet falls at a constant velocity instead of accelerating like a freely falling body. So why does Lenz's law matter? Understand this second demonstration also? That also explains the Lenz law. All of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So now you can see the third demonstration. Which is very well, it matters because it tells us we can't get something for nothing. That when we make electricity, we make it by fighting magnetic fields, by pushing, so that we still need mechanical energy to make electrical energy. Energy is conserved even if we switch forms from mechanical to electrical. We can see Lenz's law come into play in many places. One of the more interesting places is in the behavior we call maglev or magnetic levitation. Magnetic levitation generally applies to an object moving over a long distance of a non-magnetic conducting material. We can't set up a long track like that that fits in our laboratory, but if we take a stationary magnet and a spinning aluminum disc, we can get the same effect. 
we have a spinning aluminum disc underneath a strong rare earth button magnet. As the disc spins, we'll hear the noise of the magnet scraping along the aluminum disc. And as the aluminum disc picks up speed, the rate at which the magnetism changes for each surface area point of the aluminum gets higher and higher. That induces more current and more current produces more magnetism. If we move fast enough, the induced magnetism pushes back on the button magnet with its own weight and it lifts the magnet off the surface of the aluminum. We've now seen three demonstrations of lenses. So the maglev train is also working on this principle, magnetic levitation. Okay, so these are the examples where you can see the lens low. Yeah, all of you understand this? Now yes, you can sir. see this presentation. Yes, sir. Now you can see this presentation. Uh, no, yes. Sir. I think I require to. Oh, so. Okay, now you can see this. Yes. Okay. So next topic is now you can able to see this. Yes, sir. Okay. And next yes, point sir. is uh, Fleming's left hand rule and Fleming's right hand rule. Okay. So can anybody give the answer where we require this, uh, where we use this Fleming right hand rule? or Fleming left hand rule in which equipment these rules are used? When we need to find the current in the circuit, we use Fleming's left hand rule. And when we need to find the electric field, we, re we use Fleming's right hand rule, I think. So. Okay, okay. But in actual uh, practical circuit or in any practical device, where you can see these two laws, Fleming left hand, right hand rule. We have devices where you can see the Fleming right hand rule and Fleming left hand rule in any electrical device where they follow this Fleming right hand rule and Fleming right left hand rule. Yes, sir. Fleming's left hand rule is used in fan, electrical fan. Okay, okay. So what is an electrical fan? That is a motor. Okay. So in short, in the electric motor, that working on the principle of Fleming left hand rule. Clear. And same way in the electrical generator, DC generator or AC generator, that follows the Fleming right hand rule. Clear. So let's understand what is this right and left hand rule. So according to this Fleming left hand rule, when the current carrying conductor comes under the magnetic field, so there will be a force acting on the conductor and the direction of this force that can be find out using this left hand rule here yeah. and this is known as the Fleming left hand rule for the motors because in the motor that this law is applicable similarly if the conductor similarly if conductor is forcefully brought under the magnetic field and there will be an induced current in that conductor and the direction of the force that can be found using the right hand rule yes both are the different things in both the framing right and left hand rule there is a relationship between what magnetic field current and force yes there are three terms magnetic field current and force that three terms come into this left and right hand rule the relation is directly determined by framing left and right hand rules so this rule is not used to determine the magnitude, but that shows the direction of any of these three parameters. If you know any two parameters direction, then you can easily determine the direction of third parameter. So if you know the direction of magnetic field and current, you can direct, uh, you can easily know what is the direction of force. So out of these three quantity, you must know the two quantity direction so that you can identify the direction of third parameters by using these two laws. Yeah. As I say that Fleming left hand rule applicable for electric motor, right hand rule is applicable for the electric generator. It may be AC generator or it may be a DC generator. Yeah. So what is the sentence of this Fleming left hand rule? 
so it is found that when any current carrying conductor is placed inside the magnetic field force act on the conductor and in a direction that is perpendicular to both the direction of current as well as magnetic field so what is the direction of this force exactly perpendicular to the both the direction of current as well as magnetic field so here you can see that graphically by animation you can see that there is a one n pole and s pole here so as we know that the flux lines are passing from n to s so the direction of flux is what or direction of magnetic field is what n to s so if you saw this your left hand like this way your thumb is in the upper direction your first finger is in the direction of magnetic field and this middle finger that indicate the direction of current because you can see here there is a one conductor is placed and direction of this conductor is exactly perpendicular to the plane of this magnetic field magnetic field and current direction is perpendicular so exactly perpendicular to both this force is produced and that force is act on this conductor so this force actually rotate your conductors in your motor actually that is your rotor so this conductor is actually put on the rotor of the motor so when this force is act on the rotor your rotor will rotate and it's function like a motor yes yeah. so that's why this left hand rule is applicable in the electric motor so why motion is happens in the motor by providing the supply of energy so that is because of force acting on the conductor as per the fleming left hand rule but in the electric motor we not we not have the n and s pole here we have n and s pole that is a permanent magnet but actually in the motor we have electromagnet we have a conductor so by providing the supply we can create the electromagnet so that will create n and s pole same like this way and conductor is placed in between that n and s pole that conductor is placed on the rotor so when current is flowing magnetic field is set up the force is acting on the conductor and because of that your motor is rotating so that is applicable here in the motor fleming left hand rule you can see the graphically here same way fleming right hand rule so what is the definition of right hand rule what it say whenever any conductor is move inside the magnetic field and there will be a induced current in it if this conductor gets forcefully move inside the magnetic field there will be a relation between direction of the applied force magnetic field and the current and this relation you can find out by this right hand rule so if you hold the right hand hand and your first finger second finger and thumb all three are right angle to each other so in that case your four finger that represent the direction of magnetic field means your first finger indicate the direction of magnetic field thumb indicate the direction of motion it means force or you can say the applied force and then second finger that indicate the direction of induced current clear yeah. same like a left hand rule clear yeah. but it is a right hand so you can see that graphically here n and s pole direction is from n to s this shows the direction of field first finger middle finger direction of current and this thumb indicate the direction of force or direction of motion clear so let's see it graphical way also in the one of the video you can see this graphical representation let's first see the first right hand rule are you able to see this all of you no sir no sir one minute yes okay now we can see this okay 
have seen that a changing magnetic field can induce an electric current. And so one way of doing this would be to move a bar magnet towards and away from a coil. Or maybe you can hold the magnet stationary and move the coil closer and farther away from the magnet. Turns out that moving the coil is a little bit more convenient. So in this video, we will see how to remember the direction of the electric current induced when we move a coil or when we move a wire in a magnetic field. So let's consider a magnetic field due to two pole pieces of a magnet. You can imagine these are two separate magnets or these are two poles of a horseshoe magnet. The reason we're choosing this is because if we had a single magnet, then the field lines would be pretty curved as we saw before, and it'll be very difficult to understand in what direction the current will be produced. But over here, if you use arrangement like this, then at least near the center, the field will be pretty straight. But if we go farther away, of course, the field will now start curving like this. But at least in the center, the field will be straight. It'll be easier to analyze what direction the current will be. And for, the, for to, to induce a current, we need a coil. But instead of a coil, we can just move a wire. So let's introduce a wire over here. And we can move this wire up and down like this. So as we move this wire, notice it starts cutting the magnetic field. And whenever it does that, an electric current will be induced in this wire. Of course. Uh, and assume that this conductor is closed. Okay, here in the animation, you can see that it is open. Yeah. But actually, you can assume that this is a coil, so it has a closed path. So then and then current is flowing. Okay. We need a, a closed circuit for that. So we can imagine the wire from here gets connected to some galvanometer somewhere, which I've not shown over here. So let's say we move this wire up like this. We move the wire up. So we push it up. Then it turns out, if you do the experiment, the current generated in this wire, the current induced in this wire, is going to be out of the screen. All right? Somewhat like this. So the current will flow out of the screen this way. And if you were to push it down, the current will reverse. The current direction will also depend upon the direction of the magnetic field. If you reverse the direction of the magnetic field, the whole current again will reverse. So now the big question is, how do we remember this? We will not worry about why the current is outwards. We'll just say that the experiment shows that it shows us it's that way. But how do you remember this? That's the big question we want to answer. So this can be remembered by using something called the right hand generator rule. So what we do is we take our right hand and we stretch the three fingers, the thumb, the forefinger, and the middle finger this way such that they are perpendicular to each other, all of them. So this is perpendicular to this, this is perpendicular to this, if you see carefully, and even these two are perpendicular to each other. Stress them that they're all perpendicular to each other. Then the thumb represents the direction in which you are pushing the wire. So F for force, in what direction the wire is being pushed. The forefinger will tell us in what direction the magnetic field is. And the symbol for the letter for magnetic field is B, it's not M, I don't know why. Then the, th the middle finger gives us the direction of the current. And so if we were to use this right hand rule over here, we can see the force is up, the, ma the magnetic field, the forefinger is this way, and the middle finger is pointing out of the screen, just as our current. And if you were to move this wire down, then this current direction would now reverse. Now, can you use your right hand generator rule uh, one more time to convince yourself of this? Make sure that the field four finger is to the left, but this time make sure the thumb is pointing downwards and see what direction the middle finger points. Go ahead, try this. All right, if you have done it, it might look somewhat like this. The force is down, magnetic field is to the left. Now notice the current, that is your middle finger, is pointing inwards into the screen just like what we got here. 
So just for practice, let's take another example. Here we have the magnetic field coming out of the screen this way. And the conductor is going to be moved, let's say, upwards. So we'll move the conductor up like this, cutting the magnetic field. Can you figure out in what direction the current will run in this conductor? Again, pause the video and see if you can try this yourself. All right, we have to bring in our right hand. And if you align it according to the magnetic field and the push or the motion of the conductor, it would look somewhat like this. The forefinger points in the direction of the magnetic field and the thumb must point in the direction of the motion of the conductor, in the direction in which we are pushing the conductor. Then notice the middle finger points to the right. That means the current in this conductor will flow to the right. So this is how we use our right hand generator rule to figure out the direction of the current when any conductor or any wire is moved in a magnetic field. So all of you understand this concept by animation? All of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So here I saw one video on the how actually it is working in a motor and generator. Electric motor. In this mo Electric motor. Electric motor. Uh, are you able to see this video? No, sir. No, sir. Mm. Electric motor. Okay, now you can see this. Okay, so in this module, you will learn about an electric motor. As you switch on an electric fan, the blades of the fan start moving. This means that electrical energy is converted to mechanical energy. This conversion of electrical energy to mechanical energy is performed by an electric motor. An electric motor works on the principle that if an electric current is allowed to flow in a conductor placed in a magnetic field, the conductor experiences a force. As you switch on an electric fan, the blades of the fan start moving. This means that electrical energy is converted to mechanical energy. This conversion of electrical energy to mechanical energy is performed by an electric motor. As you switch on an electric fan, the blades of the fan start moving. This means that electrical energy is converted to mechanical energy. This conversion of electrical energy to mechanical energy is As the direction of the direct current changes, the direction of the rotation of the armature also changes. Again, as the key is opened, the armature stops rotating. Now, let us compare the construction and working of a DC motor to that of a DC generator. A DC motor has an input voltage supply, whereas a DC generator has a load like a bulb connected to so here in the generator, uh, we require to provide the external 
mechanical energy so that is we provide by using the prime mover so in the actual dc generator we have prime mover which rotate this rotor and because of this rotation of the rotor in between this magnetic field set up by this magnet magnetic flux interaction between this two coil as well as magnets that induce the current and this induce current flowing into this bulb okay so here the rotation of this coil in dc generator that is happen because of external mechanical energy provided by the prime mover here yeah. where here in the motor we provide the external energy here yeah. in the motor we provide the external supply so when current is flowing through this coil and this current is produced the flux this flux is interact with the flux produced by this n and s pole so because of this interaction interaction of two flux one flux of coil and another flux of this magnet that create the force as per the priming left hand rule and this this force rotates your rotor it means this coil clear yeah. so in the dc motor the rotation of the rotor happens as per the priming left hand rule and in the dc generator electricity is generated because of this rotation of your coil by the prime mover so here input energy is what mechanical energy so that mechanical energy here it is converted into electrical energy as per the priming right hand rule but here your input energy is what electrical energy which is converted into mechanical energy because your rotor is rotated by providing this energy to this coil once you open this switch your coil is not rotated your rotor will not rotate clear yeah. the carbon brushes besides in the case of a dc motor an input direct current causes the rotation of the armature whereas in the case of a dc generator the rotation of the armature results in a dc voltage across the load now let us learn about an ac motor an ac motor consists of a u shaped magnet an armature slip rings carbon brushes a key and an ac voltage supply as the key is closed an alternating current starts flowing through the armature here even though the direction of current changes at regular intervals the armature rotates in one particular direction because of the slip rings you can notice that the action of an ac motor is basically the reverse of that of an ac generator besides electric fans electric motors are used in devices such as vacuum cleaners water pumps and hair dryers in this module you have learned so understand this concept uh, where it is used left hand right hand rule what is the practical application of these two rules all of you get this yes sir Yes sir. Yes sir. Yes, sir. Is there any doubt in this lecture? So here no, I over this lecture, and we will meet tomorrow for your doubt solving session. Tomorrow we have not any lecture, but just we meet. If you have any doubt, you can ask me. So tomorrow I think at the same time between one to two p.m. I will conduct your doubt solving session. is there any problem in this time to anyone koi na koi problem che no sir no sir okay no, no sir. sir i already shared the question bank to you 
so please refer this question bank and start reading for the first internal exam and if you have any doubt then you can ask me in tomorrow doubt solving session okay so here i stop this lecture and thank you to all of you for joining this lecture so you can now leave this meeting thank you sir 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 thank you sir